When I upload videos here on YouTube, it usually takes around a handful of days to, at the most, maybe a couple of weeks of research and, you know, preparation for when I do a video. But never before have I gone to this extent to make one, as it's been roughly around four to five months of research of watching all of these films and finding all of these films to make this video. But finally it is complete and now I can finally upload it and talk about it to you guys. That being the stop motion film iceberg. At this point I'm sure we're all aware how the iceberg chart template works. So I'm not going to bother wasting time telling you how this goes. However I do want to take a minute to talk about all the criteria that need to be met for a stop motion film to be in this iceberg chart. One being the fact that it has to be a film. So full length feature films and short films count here. And I'm not going to include TV shows or music videos or anything like that. So stuff like, you know, Bob the Builder, Moral Oral, and Robot Chicken do not count. And the last criteria that needs to be met here is obviously all of these films need a form of stop motion in their films, which is any form of it from claymation and puppetry, which is honestly what we're used to seeing, which makes up a bulk of really the films I'm going to be talking about in this video, to pixelation, which is using live actors in the form of stop motion, and even cutout animation, which is using like photographs, hand-drawn pictures, and again, still using the filming technique of stop motion to give off you know, obviously the effect that they're moving is one single unit. Now, just in case you're unaware of what stop motion is, I'm gonna be a bit lazy here and just read off what the Wikipedia page is all about it. That being, stop motion is an animated filmmaking technique in which objects are physically manipulated in small increments between individual photograph frames so that they will appear to exhibit independent motion or change when the series of frames is played back. With that all addressed, now we can finally get into talking about this stop motion film iceberg chart. And like always, we started off at tier one, which I titled Children Stop Motion. This tier has all the films that are gravitated towards, obviously, children. Since stop motion is a form of animation, and nine out of ten times when an animated film is released in theaters and on the big screen, they will gravitate towards children, so it only makes sense that this would all be in tier one. It's only fitting that I start this off with really the first ever stop motion film that I was introduced to, and I feel like anyone who's roughly around my age and generation of a millennial knows of this, that being Wallace and Gromit. I decided to put the whole film series of Wallace and Gromit right here from the start because I know they've been in quite a handful of different films from A Grand Day Out, The Wrong Trousers to even uh, I remember going to the movie theaters for this one when I was a kid that being Wallace and Gromit and The Curse of the Were Rabbit I believe is the name of it and I mean it's just such a legendary name I feel like when you search up like just stop motion animation Wallace and Gromit just pops up first and they've gotten so much acclaim and so many awards throughout the decades that it's just a no-brainer to start it off with them. The Nightmare Before Christmas is a 1993 stop-motion film directed by Henry Selleck, which, doing research on this individual, I never realized how many films he's done that I just grew up watching, which obviously I'm going to be talking about later on in this video, but it's based off of the characters from Tim Burton. This is another film that I grew up watching numerous times, because I remember going to my Revu and Vavor's house, which that right there just shows you how Portuguese I am. And um, my cousin would always have this movie on VHS and I would want to watch it over and over again. Because compared to really anything else that at least I was aware of of a child, this was the only film that had stop motion. And the animation of it was just so different from what I was accustomed to that I was just really mesmerized by it all the time. Plus some of the songs on here like uh, What's This and uh, This Is Halloween still are quite the bop to this day, but I know when it comes to you know entry level and children stop motion, Nightmare Before Christmas is just a must know. Chicken Run is a children stop motion film that I remember, again, another one I watched quite a bit as a child. And the plot is basically a bunch of chickens trying to escape a 
farm. That way they won't get slaughtered or turned into chicken pot pie, essentially. And doing research about this film, one thing that I found really crazy is that the whole plot of the film is based off of another film called The Great Escape. That's like this, I don't know, war epic from the 60s that is about individuals trying to escape from a concentration camp. So it's really not that Chicken Run, again, a children's film, I think at the worst, it's rated PG, it's nothing really explicit, has themes to do with, like, people escaping the Holocaust, which is just, it's wild, but overall, it's just a fantastic film. Chicken Run 2, a sequel that took over 20 years to make, is the obvious next inclusion I feel like I need to have here. It's just now the chickens have escaped that farm, they're on a, like, desolate island, and um, they have children, essentially, and the children try to get off that island and it turns into like this big adventure of trying to save the chickens again but in a totally different area so instead of trying to escape prison they're trying to like break into it essentially is what this film is about overall solid sequel but i vastly prefer the original rudolph the red-nosed reindeer is a 1964 television special that is usually aired on big television networks around christmas this might be the only oddball in Tier 1, considering the fact that here in the United States, it's showcased every year during Christmas on big television networks, yet I couldn't find out or confirm if this is shown regularly in other countries, so I'm only going off of uh, my perspective here, but for here in the United States, this is basically a classic that just everyone knows that just falls Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer as he's kind of like a misfit in the North Pole considering the fact that obviously with his name he has a red nose and he's different and he goes on this big adventure with another elf and I don't really want to spoil it for anyone not that I really could because again I feel like so many people have watched it but it just has to do with themes of being yourself and it's a pretty just heartwarming fun movie to watch and Really not much else needs to be said here. James and the Giant Peach is a 1996 film directed by Henry Selleck. Once again, an individual I just talked about a minute ago who also directed Nightmare Before Christmas. Unlike the other films I've talked about so far, this has a mixture between stop motion and live action, as the first 10 to 15 minutes and the last 5 minutes have live action, and the bulk of it in the middle is all stop motion. Which, way later on in this video, there will be a tier dedicated to this kind of like fusion between the two. But I put James and the Giant Peach at tier one because, I mean, it's a children's film, plus it's put out through Disney. As for the plot of this movie, it follows a boy named James and a giant peach. With his friends, that being an earthworm, a grasshopper, a centipede, a spider, a ladybug, and a glow bug and they travel in this giant peach all the way to New York and they try to defeat a flying rhinoceros which as a like eight or nine year old watching this film and seeing that battle take place um it was pretty intense for uh eight year old me but regardless now even though it's kind of considered to be a box office bomb as it didn't perform that well um, obviously in its theatrical release it's kind of viewed as like this stop-motion cult classic and closing off tier one which I would argue is the strangest of the bunch is going to be Gumby the movie released in 1995 so this film is characterized as a children's stop-motion surrealist film which I, I was totally unaware of that surrealist films could make it into the audience of children, but here we are with this. Now, Gumby is this green humanoid person that is loosely based off of the gingerbread man that's actually been around the character Gumby since the 50s. Being in numerous TV shows like The Gumby Show and Gumby Adventures. But with Gumby the movie, it follows, obviously, Gumby and friends trying to rescue their farm that they live on that's about to be basically stolen from other individuals from this world. 
that um, they tried to raise a fundraiser with a concert to save the farm. And you can watch the whole thing here on YouTube, which is uh, quite convenient. But um, you can tell it's quite low budget compared to everything else I've talked about thus far. But considering how animated and fun and colorful everything is, I don't know where else to put this film and how just long running the character has been for over like half a century um, at this point. I feel like Gumby's just fits in tier one, but make no mistake about it, it's the weirdest of the bunch, as I said. With tier one complete, we move down one level to tier two, which is titled Adolescent Stop Motion. Just like tier one, these are stop motion films that will appeal to children. The only difference being in tier one, it would appeal to children of the ages of 10 and under, where adolescent stop motion tier two here would be it's appealing to children the ages 10 and above. Coraline is a 2009 dark fantasy stop motion film, and now the third film in this video, directed by Henry Selleck, and it's based off of the novels of Neil Gaiman's work. I gotta say, for a film that's rated PG and is geared towards children, there are a lot of dark and creepy undertones played throughout the whole film. I've even seen people describe it as it's a horror film for children, which is very, very rare to come by because it's not often something you see geared towards children either. I don't want to spoil this film, but what it has is a mother with these dark, menacing, button black eyes, a dad who's very overworked, which has been used on numerous amounts of memes, the picture of him, and a cat voiced by Keith David, which is really cool. Quartz Bride is a 2005 fantasy musical stop motion film directed by both Mike Johnson and Tim Burton. Visually, this film is very similar to that of Nightmare Before Christmas, as they're both very dark and gloomy. The differences being Nightmare Before Christmas is a bit more, you know, animated and child-friendly, as it really has to do with Halloween stealing from Christmas, where Quartz Bride has themes to do with marriage, obviously, finding oneself, and um, if you love something, set them free, is basically the themes of this movie. Overall, it's a fun film, great animation, that I would give two thumbs up. Kubo and the Two Strings is a 2016 action fantasy stop motion film directed by Travis Knight. This film is about a boy named Kubo who takes refuge with his mother inside of a mountain who are both hiding from Kubo's grandfather who is trying to steal Kubo's other eye. Which I know sounds very weird of a description for this film, but if you know of it or you're about to watch it, it makes total sense. Visually and production-wise, this film is incredible. From what I searched up, it's the last stop-motion film to get nominated at the Oscars for Best uh, Special Effects. Last film to do so was Nightmare Before Christmas. So, I can't stress enough the visuals for this film, top tier. Plus as well, I believe from what I also searched up, this film holds the record for the largest stop-motion puppet it, I believe the height for it was roughly 40 feet tall and it weighed somewhere around like 400 pounds maximum. I'm not going to spoil what character that is for, but can't stress enough, production and visuals, very ambitious and incredible. Fantastic Mr. Fox is a 2009 comedy stop motion film directed by Wes Anderson and is my wife's personal favorite stop motion film. Right off the bat, when my wife introduced me to this film, I automatically knew this was going to be a great film just by the cast. It's an all-star cast overall. You got George Clooney, Meryl Streep, Bill Murray, William Dafoe, and Owen Wilson all doing voice acting on this one film. In typical Wes Anderson fashion, the comedy is very whimsical, the cinematography is very bright, colorful, and vibrant. And even though the plot is pretty simplistic of you're just following Mr. Fox pull off all of these schemes to raid all of the farmers around his area of food and resources, it was just a really fun film to watch that honestly I would totally be up for re-watching again. 
Speaking of Wes Anderson, it's only fitting that the next film I now talk about is Isle of Dogs, released in 2018. Out of everything in this particular tier, Isle of Dogs would be what I would consider to be the most explicit in terms of its content, yet it's rated PG-13, but it still obviously gravitated towards children as one of the main characters is only, what, a 12-year-old boy, and you're really keeping up with all of the dogs in this film. As the plot goes, you have this Japanese dictator that wanted to exile all of these dogs and segregate them to an island after they've gone kind of like rabid and there's like this dog disease going through everything. And they try to have like this scientist gain a cure for them, but there's like this inside job where they don't want the dogs to be uh, segregated back with the humans. And it's a pretty kind of like complex story that, I don't know, I feel like adults would easily gravitate towards what's happening here and the themes it's kind of like portraying. But the comedy and visuals are clearly meant to gravitate towards like, you know, a younger audience. Regardless, just like uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox, the visuals are still very stunning, vibrant, and colorful. The comedy is still whimsical because, of course, it's a Wes Anderson film. But out of everything here, as I stated, this would be what I would state as the most explicit. The Adventures of Mark Twain is a 1985 adventure stop-motion film. In this film, Mark Twain pilots a giant airship where he tends to fly it through space to get to Halley's Comet. During that journey, three children sneak aboard that airship, that being Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, and Becky Thatcher, which just by those names alone that I announced, you can tell that this film has a lot of references to Mark Twain's work. I ended up watching the whole film, but what's funny is how I discovered this film a handful of years ago because there was this YouTube video titled just simply the creepiest scene of any children's film. And what it is, is from this movie, and it's just one little five minute scene, where during their adventures in that airship, they come across an individual who is an angel, and his name is Satan. And what's so crazy about this scene, and how creepy it is for a children's film out of anything, is it has themes to do with like the futility of human nature, which is really extreme for a children's film, I'll just say that. But um, it's easily the thing that this film is most known for, and it's quite the standout. And the final film, closing out Tier 2, is actually the most recent one, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio from 2022. For the most part, this film by Del Toro follows the same story as any other different rendition of Pinocchio, just famously known just like the uh, 1940s Walt Disney classic Pinocchio, where Pinocchio is a wooden boy, he wants to be a real boy, and towards the end of the film he gets swallowed up by a whale. It is um, basically the similarities between Del Toro's and Disney's, but just like in Del Toro's fashion, there's a lot more of like this dark themes embedded within it, and it has a form of realism as well, considering the fact that the setting is in Italy during 1940, whereas, you know, Italy was a part of the triple axis of World War II. I don't want to dive any deeper into this film as I'll get into like spoiler territory. Just overall, I would strongly recommend watching this film because out of everything I put in Tier 2, this is my personal favorite. I was really just surprised at how good everything was. The animation's really well done, the story is very well told, and overall Del Toro knocks it out of the park here, I feel like. And I'm pretty sure it's still available on Netflix, which I feel like everyone just kind of like has at this point of a streaming service. So I would strongly encourage to check out this film. Once again, we move down another tier into this iceberg chart. We have now reached tier three, which is titled Live Action Stop Motion Fusion. Earlier on in this video, when I talked about James and the Giant Peach, it had a mixture between live action and stop motion. It's just it's in tier one because it's so gravitated towards children. Whereas all of these films and this tier has obviously both live action and stop motion playing side by side. It's just 
the age range isn't so, you know, gravitated towards, like, one particular, like, you know, children or adult audience. It's just mixed, I guess is the best way to put it. Just overall, I feel like of any age group, these films would appeal to somebody. Starting this off with the legendary King Kong from 1933, I really don't feel like I need to waste any time of what this film's about, as there's been so many different adaptations about it. I know Peter Jackson did it in 2005, and I know now King Kong, has, his name anyway, has been thrown around quite a bit considering that of recently he's doing films with Godzilla. I know there's going to be another one coming out next week. So King Kong's name has just been thrown around now for, at this point, almost a century. And it all started with the original from 1933 in black and white. And, I, I mean, seriously, what, what more needs to be said here? It's, it's King Kong. The Lost World is a 1925 silent film monster feature, I guess it's what it's kind of labeled as, that is basically Jurassic Park, but like a century earlier. I'm pretty sure this film inspired Jurassic Park as a whole, as it's just humans voyaging to a distant island that just has dinosaurs roaming around there. And really the point of this film, from what I get the plot of, it's more of just like being of like a spectacle of these uh, special effects during its time of stop motion, all done by Willis O'Brien, which I forgot to mention, Willis O'Brien is also the same individual who did all the stop motion for King Kong. So he's quite the influential figure when it comes to, you know, this hybrid of like having these special effects of stop motion in film. But it's widely considered to be a film way ahead of its time and really brought to life dinosaurs onto the big screen. Jason and the Argonauts is a 1963 epic adventure that follows the mythological story of Jason and the Argonauts in search of the Golden Fleece. Even though this film is over 60 years old and you could state that the special effects and the techniques that they use for this film look dated or fake, I gotta be honest, this film's kind of aged like fine wine to my eyes anyway. Because when, yeah, you look at all the special effects in stop motion of when Jason's fighting either the skeletons, the serpent, or this kind of like giant iron statue, yeah, you could state it doesn't look real, but the techniques and ambitions that they had to make these props and to have it like physically done for the set it just feels a bit more authentic, I feel like. And that's one thing I really admire about practical effects with really any film, is that, yeah, even though they look fake, I feel like in the world of cinema, it's eye candy to me. And I think they age a lot better than really any CGI effects you can think of. If you're like myself and you admire these stop motion special effects, one person to give a tremendous amount of credit to would be Ray Harryhausen whose work is found on Jason and the Argonauts, along with the next film I'll be talking about, that being The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. It's a 1958 fantasy adventure film. In this film, you follow Sinbad and his crew as they voyage to Baghdad, and this is the first film as a part of a trilogy, the other films being The Golden Voyage of Sinbad and Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. However, during their voyage to Baghdad, Sinbad and crew come across a sorcerer who ends up putting an incantation on Sinbad's wife, thus shrinking her. And the only way that Sinbad can turn his wife back to normal is if he takes that sorcerer and his crew to this mystical island called, I believe, uh, Colossa. And the reason for that is that the island has this mystical, magical lamp of a, with a genie in it that the sorcerer wants to obtain back. And when on that island, they come across all of these you know, mystical creatures of a cyclops, a dragon, and a two-headed giant bird known as a rook. In terms of special effects, considering the fact that it's still the same person who does all of the uh, stop-motion effects here, I feel like the quality is just as good as Jason and the Argonauts, where if you enjoy Jason and the Argonauts, definitely check out The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, and vice versa. Beetlejuice is a 1988 fantasy horror comedy 
directed by Tim Burton. Apologies if I sound lazy here, but I really don't want to dive too much into the plot of this movie, mainly because like 98% of this film is live action and it seems kind of odd at first that I'm including it in a stop motion iceberg chart. The reason for it is there's two scenes in particular as to why I'm including it that I remember watching this film as a child and it absolutely spooked me out. That being when Beetlejuice turns into a serpent which got like this uncanny valley kind of effect that I got from watching this film. And the scene that absolutely terrified me, even though it's only like a minute long, is when the deceased married couple tries to scare out uh, all the individuals in the mansion and they try to look as horrifying as possible and there's this stop motion moment that happens for only a few seconds where they twist and turn and manipulate their face into like these wild crazy looking monsters that um, still to this day freaks me out and just from that alone I want to include Beetlejuice in this video. Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back is a 1980 epic science fiction film that I'm not even going to waste my breath bothering discussing what the plot is all about because Star Wars is this global phenomenon that has an endless amount of fans throughout the decades and I'm going to be saying nothing new. The only reason why it's included is during the battle on Hoth, the AT-AT machines uh, piloted by the Empire when they're on screen it's all stop motion special effects which is worthy of mentioning because it's all done by Phil Tibbet and later on in this video some of his work will be discussed in this iceberg chart. And closing out tier 3 is actually the latest film to be included in this tier. That being Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. It's a comedy drama mockumentary film released in 2021. It's a very heartwarming film that's about Marcel who is a shell that gained somewhat of this internet fame from years ago because actually they were shorts put on YouTube gaining like tens of millions of views and I guess they made like this mockumentary full-length feature film about Marcel the Shell and what's really surprising is that this was put out through A24 Studios which I just wouldn't expect because I know that Studio A24 for so many other like horror and explicit movies I would have never expect them to have this in their filmography. But like I said, it's a very sweet and heartwarming film that follows Marcel looking for his family that's not in his house that he resides in anymore as they fled to a completely different home and they're on a search to find them. And throughout it with this kind of like, again, mockumentary kind of style they go with it, you learn more about Marcel and how he's a shell and how he kind of like lives his life and routine that um, it's a bit off the beaten path for most like comedy drama films but as I stated it's really heartwarming having this kind of like connection with a shell out of all things. Descending down the chart once again to tier 4 titled Adult Stop Motion. The title for this tier is pretty self-explanatory. These are all stop motion films that would gravitate towards adults. And the reason why it's so low on this iceberg chart is more often than not when it comes to stop motion or really any animated feature length film and shorts, they're always gravitated towards children more often than not, where a minority of them tends to be explicitly for adults. And there's only a handful that I was able to come across that are within the realms of stop motion that are meant for adults here. Kicking this tier off is going to be Mary and Max, a 2009 psychological comedy drama directed by Adam Elliott. The movie follows two individuals, Mary and Max, who are two outcasts basically from where they grow up that are just looking for friends and they end up being pen pals thanks to Mary if you watch the film you understand how they become so that even though Mary I believe is a child and Max is I think like in his 40s or 50s, I know he's middle-aged here, with the kind of like pen pal uh, mailing kind of exchange that they have going on, they find common ground with each other, and even though they never meet in the film per se, they end up becoming friends with each other that becomes both 
heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. One thing I gotta give credit towards this film is how they portray Asperger's Syndrome because I know Max, the character here, has Asperger's and they portray it in a very tasteful way. It's not just like, ah, he's awkward one minute, then a brainiac the next minute. Like, a lot of, like, Hollywood movies and TV shows kind of do on primetime that's, like, really unrealistic. It's way more realistic and tasteful, as I stated, that I feel like people might look at Asperger's Syndrome a little bit differently when watching this film, which I gotta give it credit towards. But again, I think it's a really emotionally powerful movie that showcases that animation and stop motion can portray a lot more substance to it than just uh, it looks different compared to other forms of animation. Just overall a very well done film. Anomalisa is a psychological comedy drama released in 2015 directed by Charlie Kaufman. In Anomalisa, it's a story about a writer named Michael who's sick of his mundane life and looks for inspiration in other ways. I don't want to spoil the plot of this film, and the best way that I can summarize it without spoiling anything is this film feels like it's a critique on films such as Scott Pilgrim vs. The World and Eternal Sunshine for a Spotless Mind, where it's like an individual who feels like he doesn't have any purpose in his existence should find, you know, self-help from his own problems instead of looking to dump all of it on another person. Last thing about this film that I want to add is I gotta give props to the voice acting crew on this film because even though there's roughly around half a dozen or so even more characters being shown in this film, there's only three voice actors I think on uh, the cast here, which when you watch the film, you'll understand why that is. $9.99 is an adult stop motion film released in 2008. And gonna be upfront here with my bias, out of everything in this iceberg chart, I would state this is probably my least favorite that I watched. And I'm not including it because, oh, I watched it, so I guess I need to, but because the themes of this movie I do admire, as without spoiling anything, you're following an ensemble of characters that all live in this apartment, and it all really has to do with themes of existentialism, which you really don't come across that really with most films, and this film just full on goes into that territory, which I feel like with the themes about it, it's ambitious and it's worth talking about, but other than that, I really don't know what else I can really discuss with this film, other than if you're looking for a existentialist film, maybe give this film a shot. The House is a stop-motion horror film from 2022 that originally was a mini-series on British TV, but Netflix adapted it to an anthology on their streaming service. If you decide to watch it on Netflix, it's three families with three different stories that all are contained in this house that they live under. Again, all of it's stop motion, and overall it just feels like, you know, horror stories of themes to do with madness, grief, and other like horror tropes that I feel like if you are a horror fanatic film fan, uh, definitely check out The House as I feel like it will definitely appeal to you. Stop Motion is a 2023 psychological horror film that blends both live action and stop motion animation. What's funny about this on a personal note is when my wife found out that I was compiling all different films for an iceberg chart video for stop motion, she immediately said why you need to watch the film stop motion as it's one of the latest films um, included here. It's the newest one from only last year. And overall what this film kind of depicts is funny enough, animators who create stop motion and it's about a mother and her daughter that are working on the last feature-length film that the mother was going to create before she died. However, when you watch this film, you'll notice that the mother is extremely abusive to her daughter, and this is where we create like this psychological horror into the film. And even though they're creating stop motion, it's like an allegory for what's actually happening in the story's uh, overall film and uh, setting that they're trying to create with the plot. 
that even though this is on Shutter, the streaming service, which I always feel like Shutter just has like a, a like a bunch of uh, horror films that are like a dime a dozen. This one really stood out to me, not only because it's stop motion and it's not like I was desperate for finding adult films, but how it kind of mirrors the plot with the uh, stop motion. It's really creative and well thought out. My Life as a Zucchini, as it's titled here in North America, but in France it's titled My Life as a Courgette, is a 2016 comedy drama. Out of everything here in the adult stop motion tier list, this is probably the most innocent. And not only because it's rated PG-13 where everything else is either, you know, R-rated or you know, not rated, this feels the most innocent because it has to do with, you know, not only are the characters children for the most part, but having to live in an orphanage, having the feelings of not being wanted, and kind of like these alienated feelings of love from an adult for these kids when you watch this film, it's really heartbreaking that even though it's children for like the main characters here, I really don't know how in any sense this film would try to appeal to children with these really dark and heartbreaking themes that even though it's PG-13 it's, as it's rated, I feel like this just gravitates towards way more to an adult audience, hence why it's in this tier. Memorable is a 2019 French adult stop motion short film that's roughly only 10 or 12 minutes long that is really depressing and beautiful at the same time, mainly because it has themes to do with Alzheimer's disease. As I stated earlier, it's a very depressing yet beautiful film that even got it nominated at the Oscars for Best Short Film. What I truly admire about this film is it showcases with animation that, you know, you can bring forth very touchy, bleak, and very adult themes onto animation films and still portray it in a very beautiful and, you know, tasteful way that just showcases that animation can be for adults when you have this level of quality attached with it. My Little Goat is a 2018 horror stop-motion short film that I recently discovered only a handful of days ago, and it's actually in full here on YouTube. Now, it's only 10 minutes long, and the story is pretty self-explanatory, so I don't want to say really that much about it, other than it has themes to do with, like, child abuse, which is extremely touchy, but um, for a stop-motion film to portray that in this really explicit and kind of, like, grotesque way, um, it's pretty eye-opening and disturbing, to say the least. And for people who are looking for more of like the disturbing types of content and stop motion films, uh, this might appeal to you. Chuck Steele, Night of the Trampires, is a 2018 action comedy stop motion film that was a much needed shakeup from everything else I've talked about thus far in this tier. Because where every other film has themes to do that could be depressing, horror, or slightly disturbing, to finally come across a film that is very tongue-in-cheek, lowbrow, vulgar, with a lot of just obnoxious humor that pays homage to uh, action films of the 80s, it was much needed in a breath of fresh air for me personally watching this. Even though the comedy is very crude, the plot is incredibly outlandish, and the action is very oversaturated. The animation is stellar throughout this film, that if you're looking for all thrills, just a ton of action, a lot of violence, with just hair metal blasting every 10 minutes, this is the film for you. Finally finished with Tier 4, we move down another level to Tier 5, that being Fever Dream Stop Motion. This is where things become a bit more different, weirder, and we start getting into territory now where it's taking you to a completely different world where the sense of realism is really starting to dwindle now. Since we have reached this point in the iceberg chart, that means I can now finally talk about the film I've been dying to talk about. It's really the film that got me started making this iceberg chart, that being Mad God. 
This is a 2021 experimental horror stop motion film written, produced, and directed by Phil Tippett. A film that's 30 years in the making. And I don't think it was 30 years of Phil Tippett going consecutively back and forth with it, but it was always in the back burner of one of his projects that he was meaning to do. And only as of recently, he really kind of like got a team to work on this film. Visually speaking, this is the most pulverizing and eye-opening, really out of everything I will be talking about in this video, that in terms of the visuals, this is my personal favorite stop-motion film, that when it comes to the themes and overall story of it, it's left for interpretation as I've seen so many people go on totally different routes or explanations about this film that I feel like it's going to be kind of like this slow burn long lasting type of film that for years to come people will still be talking about it because there's no direct narrative it's going for and although I have my own personal interpretation of it that's for you know another day I feel like because I could go on for hours just like so many other people have with their explanations on this film. I just view it that it's a master class of stop motion animation that if you want eye candy for stop motion, Mad God is the film to watch. But be warned, it's going to throw you in so many different directions of what it's trying to, I guess, say to its audience. Junkhead is a 2017 Japanese kind of like dystopian science fiction stop motion film that even though I just gushed over Mad God with its visuals and concept for stop motion, if there is one other film that at least rivals the visuals of Mad God that I would recommend to everyone who else is gushing over Mad God, I would strongly recommend you check out the film Junkhead. Best way I could summarize this film is take the very gritty and detailed claymations and puppetry of Mad God with its visuals and apply the story of THX 1138, you know, the George Lucas film that everyone forgets, as the plot of this movie. And as I stated again, visually it's incredible. The overall story might be kind of hard to follow because there's really no dialogue in it, just like with Mad God, but I can't emphasize enough, if you enjoy Ma Mad God as so many other people have, again, watch Junkhead right after it because I definitely feel like it will appeal to fans of Mad God. Blood Tea and Red Strings is a 2006 dark fantasy stop motion film that's often characterized as a fairy tale for adults. It's just, I didn't put it in tier 4 because when I ended up watching this film, um, I had a really difficult time trying to analyze what it's really about as it's in this fairy tale world with like these creatures that look like a mixture between a bat and a bird and they make this kind of like goddess figure that they hang up on their tree and these white mice steal it from them and they just get drunk off of red tea and uh, even with that description I really don't feel like it's like verbally possible for me to spoil this film because no matter how much I try to dissect it or make sense of it I just can't and maybe that's the whole point with like the whole fairy tale setting they're trying to create but I guess it has themes to do with gluttony maybe but um yeah good luck trying to figure out what this film's about and if any of you can please tell me because I'm kind of dumbfounded as to what it's about but I'll give it credit where credit's due because it was weird and it definitely took me in a fairy tale setting. Fantastic Planet is a 1973 experimental science fiction art film, I guess, that, um, man, where do I begin with it? <laughs> I guess for starters, Visually, it's not claymation or puppets. It all has to do with, you know, paper cutouts, and it still counts as stop motion. So this film is taken into the setting of an alien planet where its inhabitants are these blue humanoid um, aliens called Trogs. And on that planet, there are humans called Oms. 
As this film progresses on, you realize that Trogs look at Oms, you know, humans, that they're subhuman, they're animals, we can keep them as pets, or we could just exterminate them on will. They're just a nuisance to them. And what ends up happening is obviously the humans rebel, or the Oms rebel, and they find themselves kind of like establishing a society and civilization in a park and thus they try to rebel against the trogs and try to even find a new home for them it's a really weird film but visually it's really impressive just how alien everything is especially the art design and for me at least it was eye candy that being said when it comes to the themes of this film from what i looked up it has to have like somewhat of like this allegory towards like colonization and racism, which is quite interesting for a 1973 film to do. But yeah, definitely not for everyone because it's very experimental for you know cinema standards. But again, for people who are looking for films outside the box, this has kind of become like a cult classic that I feel like for weirdos who enjoy films like this it'll appeal to you. Toys in the Attic is a 2009 fantasy stop-motion film based out of the Czech Republic. Um, not much to say about it other than visually it's really mesmerizing. Uh, to summarize it in short, it's as if Toy Story was on meth is uh, <laughs> the best way I can put it because visually it's mesmerizing, like, good luck just watching this and trying to have, like, a straight face throughout its overall runtime, and it's just full of chaotic energy, and I'll just leave it at that. The Wolf House is a 2018 Chilean, I guess I'll just leave it at, surrealist stop-motion film that I watched the whole thing here on YouTube, and you can do as well for free, that it's really abstract the ways it does its storytelling, but from what I gathered reading the synopsis is it follows the character of a little girl named Maria who escapes from her colony because she couldn't contribute anything to it and there are wolves trying to get her and she finds salvation in this house in the woods with these two pigs where they kind of treat her like parent figures I guess and with all of her trauma and emotions going through her the house kind of becomes like this, I don't know, art piece that kind of showcases all of her emotions in this kind of like abstract narrative. Visually, it's an incredible film, and the techniques that they use to showcase and narrate the story is really unorthodox and creative. It's just really experimental. Like, I don't really know if many people find enjoyment with it. But if you're, again, looking for more experimental filmmaking, The Wolf House, really creative stuff that is really dark and twisted at some points. Alice is a 1988 surrealist film that blends both live action and stop motion animation, and it's directed by Jan Svenkmayer. Once again, this is another film I was able to watch in full for free here on YouTube. As for the story, it follows the same steps as other renditions of Alice in Wonderland, only with Alice now, it's all about the girl Alice, as she's just basically bored in her playroom, and the surrealist parts about it are when she's kind of imagining this fantasy world, again, like in Alice in Wonderland, only she doesn't actually go there. She's just imagining everything out of boredom, basically, what is what this film is about. And it's all the stop-motion parts in this film that both are mesmerizing, but honestly freaked me out quite a bit. Mainly because all the stop-motion figures are taxidermy, which is already creepy enough, plus all the things that she's seeing in her playroom is what then to come to life, basically. And again, it's really off the beaten path because there's really no dialogue that's exchanged between Alice and all of the kind of like animated creatures. It's the only dialogue you're hearing is when Alice like goes in, I guess, third person and narrates everything. Overall, it's a really weird film and I really enjoyed it. Faust is a 1994 comedy 
drama, fantasy, stop motion, live action, hybrid film. It's directed by the same guy who did Alice. I don't want to butcher his name again. It's already bad enough that I did once. And holy hell, my wife and I had no idea what we were getting ourselves into when I watched this, other than just I want to add and know more films that utilize stop motion. And we had such a blast watching this film because we were laughing non-stop. Like, yeah, there are comedy elements to it, but it just gets so outlandish and it's trying to portray like this, I don't know, like theater setting with how the story's being told that um, it's just so unorthodox. And we were laughing so much because we were just having so much fun watching this film that I would say out of all the films I watched, this easily has the most like fun factor with it. it, it I can't stress enough how outlandish every freaking scene is in this movie besides like the first 15 minutes where it's kind of just to establish who faust is in the real world in uh prague but man it is so fun i really don't want to ruin that much other than it has a lot of chaotic energy the stop motion is just ridiculous and again i know i'm repeating myself but it's just such an outlandish film Tier 5 is finished, so once again we move down the iceberg chart another level to Tier 6, that being titled Abstract Stop Motion. Everything in this tier, I really feel like no matter what I say about it, I can even like spoil the whole plot of it. It doesn't really give it justice as to what you will see in these films, but I'll try my best to give like a brief summary about them, but it's abstract stop motion. It's going to be a lot more experimental. The themes might be very simplistic in a very odd sense or very complex to the point that there's a multitude of meanings behind them. Just overall, I feel like now we've reached the point where the selling point about these films I'm going to be talking about are just the visual aspects about them alone. Bobby Yeh is a 2012 adult surrealist body horror stop motion short i think <laughs> it's only like 20 or so minutes long and again it's something that you can watch in full here on youtube um i really don't know what i got out of this film other than just wild chaotic stop motion animation from start to finish from what i gather in the synopsis which even this doesn't really clarify anything. It's that Bobby Yeh, which I'm assuming is this individual right here, um, has commits petty theft, and there is justice that needs to be served to him, which is why he's chased down, I think. Um, I really can't tell you what this film's about. It's just really, really wild stop motion. It's abstract in concept. Nothing really makes sense, and this should just like lay out the foundation for what the rest of the films are going to be talked about in this tier. Bestia is a short stop motion film released in 2021 that is all about this kind of like insider woman around the time of the Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship in Chile from the 70s all the way to the early 90s, her name being Ingrid Olderok. I think is how you pronounce it, probably wrong, but it's a depiction of a very sadistic woman who violated a lot of human rights acts. And this stop motion film is kind of like a rendition of all these heinous things that she did and the mindset of it, exploring some really disturbing um, ideas and themes in this film. And um, man, the things I saw, for a stop motion film that have to do with the dog, I hope I never see that again. Street of Crocodiles is a 1986 experimental stop motion film directed by the Quay Brothers. Visually, this film is very dark, gloomy, and gritty that really starts to explore more of like the uncanny valley type of territory that kind of creeps me out a little bit. As for the themes of it, there's really no dialogue being exchanged throughout the whole film other than towards the end of it, you have these credits that pop up kind of describing what the film's all about. 
a feeling kind of like isolated when industrialization on a city kind of changes everything is uh, kinda, I guess, what the themes are about. But if it wasn't for the end credits uh, really discussing everything for me, I would have no idea what's going on in this film. As for the legacy of this film, one thing I found to be really interesting is that the set piece for it helped heavily inspire the Nine Inch Nails music video for the song Closure. And for the legacy of the Quay Brothers, they actually have quite a lengthy filmography of all other different like short stop motion films that are in the same kind of like aesthetic as Street of Crocodiles. But the most amount of attention that they probably got in terms of accolades is back in 2015, Christopher Nolan, the same Christopher Nolan who directed, you know, the Batman trilogy and did Oppenheimer and got all these Oscar awards, did a short documentary film about the Quay Brothers back in 2015, which is really interesting. And it's cool to see someone like Christopher Nolan with all of the, you know, accolades, awards, and just, you know, attention that he gets do a documentary on the Quay Brothers who are quite obscure. Dimension and Dialogue is a 1983 short stop motion film directed by the same individual who did Faust and Alice. And it's this low on the iceberg chart because it all has to do with themes of how humans interact with each other, both in body language and obviously, you know, what we say to each other. It's just, you wouldn't think that when you watch this short film as it's only like maybe 11 or 14 minutes long because it's hard to concentrate on that aspect with this film where it gets just so weird and, you know, odd that, it, again, it goes into, like, that uncanny valley territory, which just visually, it just threw me off so hard. Opal is a 2020 short stop-motion film directed by Jack Stopper, which Jack Stopper got his start here on YouTube making YouTube videos and over the years has gained somewhat of a reputation for these very really weird unorthodox uh, short films of animation that kind of breaks into music and it's so just Jack Stopper's style basically is what he's turned it into but in 2020 he was able to get one of his short films to be released on Adult Swim Halloween night which this would gain the most amount of attraction out of anything he's released to date in terms of his animation. And what this film is all about, even though it's only like 10 or 15 minutes long, it has to do with themes of child neglect and abuse on a psychological standpoint. I don't really want to spoil that much about it here, as I try my best to not really spoil really anything with these films, but there is kind of somewhat a clear narrative with this film compared to everything else in this tier of like abstract stop motion. Um, definitely check it out. Again, it's only 10 or 15 minutes long. It's on the Adult Swim YouTube channel and it's some really, really creative stuff. Mechanics is a 2003 experimental stop motion film that, man, it's just nightmare fuel from beginning to end. It's very jarring, the story is very disconjointed, so it's kind of hard to follow along with, that you really need to find a synopsis to even make heads or tails of really what anything's going on. But from what I gather, it's, we're on this alien planet, and the alien species is dominant over us humans, and the humans are trying to find salvation with it in terms of any means necessary from even like, evolution where we kind of like embed our being and DNA and our essence into this planet. Um, it, it just doesn't really make sense. It's really, really weird. The um, kind of like grainy filter they use over everything makes it seem as if this was made for like Portal, the, you know, the band from Australia, that death metal band, just how it's showcased in the sense that everything looks very antique-like, but it's still very alien. It's really hard to pinpoint exactly what they're trying to go for here other than just different, otherworldly, and experimental. Um, definitely not a film for everyone, but this is the kind of film that makes Mad God look normal. The Sandcastle is a 1977 
stop motion short and I'm including it in this tier because after all the wild and zany and bizarre things I've talked about thus far that can get somewhat disturbing, I feel like this needs to be included just to recollect myself. It's abstract in nature because there's really no theme, idea, or story being presented here. It's just a bunch of sand figures in the sand, um, just creating a little building, being all happy and giddy. It's very playful, the music's very upbeat and fun, and I just consider it abstract because after everything I've been watching over the past handful of months to do research for this iceberg chart, so just come across something that's just basically, hey, I can do this with stop motion is um, something I needed, I guess, after watching the rest. So definitely a film that's worthy of taking a break from everything else I've talked about thus far. That being said, I go right back into the bizarre and unknown territory because the final inclusion for abstract stop motion is going to be Heaven and Hell Magic. This is a 1962 avant-garde cutout stop motion film, which just that genre tag alone, I, I don't feel like I need to say much about it because I don't know what to say about it. I watched the whole thing here on YouTube that runs for a little over an hour long and I don't know what the hell I watched. I have no idea what any of this means. Maybe it's a form of Dadaism where it's just like anything and everything can be art. I don't really know what else to say about it other than when I did watch it, it kind of gave off like this hypnotic effect to me. Maybe it's because of like all these weird like droney dark ambient noises that happen throughout the film. But other than that, all I can say is if you are looking for the strangest stop motion film that I came across, um, Heaven and Earth Magic. Yeah. And with that, we finally moved down another tier to the final level of this iceberg chart, that being tier 7 titled Forgotten Stop Motion. All the films in this tier are all stop motion features that have either been forgotten about through time, have been lost media, or just really, really obscure. El Postal was a 1917 comedy stop motion film all done through cutout. That is a lost film considering the fact that in 1926 the film was destroyed in a studio fire. From what we know about this film is that it's widely considered to be the first ever stop-motion full-length feature film, and the plot all has to do with a satirical take of their Argentine president during this time. Not much else is known about the film other than it's just considered to be lost media. The Cameraman's Revenge is a 1912 Russian stop-motion short film that only runs for about 10 or 11 minutes and it's really cool that you can watch the whole thing here on YouTube which I got to admit this is one thing I really enjoy about YouTube where you can archive like historical media such as this but what's really interesting about it doing research from some of the comments I've read and um, what it's really about is that a lot of people truly believed when this film was released in 1912 all of the insects that are used as like you know props and characters for this film were real and alive and that the director trained them on how to move and coordinate themselves which people were really um believing that again this is still around the time where cinema is still new to the public as it's only 1912 and stop motion was still a very new thing but again, really cool that a film that's over a hundred years old is archived here on YouTube. Long Live the Bull is a 1926 American short stop motion film and is widely considered to be the first ever stop motion to include and utilize claymation. Once again, this is another film you can watch here in full on YouTube. It's only 14 or 15 minutes long and it follows a bullfighter who befriends a bull that way, later on in the film, they can have a bullfight, the bullfighter will win, and win the love of his love interest during the end of it. Hexen is a 1922 silent film that has minimal usage of stop motion, so I included it in this video. 
Overall, it does have like cult status among moviegoers that know of it. And I know that kind of goes against the name of this tier, Forgotten Stop Motion, but I included it here because it's often ignored by just so many other like horror films out there that when it comes time to Halloween, no one ever discusses this film, which just looks like a Halloween movie as it has grave robbing, you know, satanic rituals, witchcraft, that during this time, that would just be something of like taboo like in 1922. But to have a film about it in the silent film category in 1922, where it's very rough and grainy, just the, you know, film itself, it really adds to the aesthetic of it that I would state for horror fans that really want something pretty creepy, especially when they use the puppetry and stop motion that gets, again, into that uncanny valley of that witchcraft, satanic, spooky type of uh, cinema. This is overall a film that is a must-know that, as I stated, doesn't get enough attention. And the final inclusion for this stop motion film iceberg chart is going to be widely considered as the first ever stop motion animation in existence, that being the Humpty Dumpty Circus. It was originally released in 1898. It's the only film here that's released in the 19th century. Sadly, it's lost media as there is no archive footage of it other than the fact that there is one screenshot that exists. And that'll do it for this iceberg chart all about stop motion films. I really hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did making this video, doing all months of research and watching of all different films, that easily this is the most amount of time and energy I've ever put into an iceberg chart. And I'm pretty proud of myself to say the very least. But yeah, that'll do it here, guys. Really hope you discovered something new, and other than that, make sure, like always, you guys drink plenty of water to stay hydrated, and have a great day.